I'm Laura Walker, president of Bennington College. I wanna offer my sincere congratulations to all of the members of the 52nd graduating class of the Bennington Writing Seminars. Here at Bennington, we are particularly proud of our writers and of our literary legacy. You now join a talented group of alumni that is more than 2,000 members strong and that has contributed to a vibrant life of letters that continues to shape American literature. While we're really sorry we can't be together in Vermont this June, I look forward to welcoming you back to campus as alumni as soon as we can. In the meantime, congratulations. We're very proud of you. I'm Mark Wunderlich and I'm the director of the Bennington Writing Seminars. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our June 2021 commencement. While I'm sorry we can't all be together on our campus this June, it is our hope to welcome our students back to Bennington in January of 2022. In the meantime, I have the great pleasure of introducing our longtime friend of Bennington, Wayne Kestenbaum who will deliver this year's commencement address. Wayne Kestenbaum is a poet, critic, novelist, artist, and performer. And he has published 21 books, including Figure It Out, Camp Marmalade, My 1980s and Other Essays, The Anatomy of Harpo Marx, Humiliation, Hotel Theory, Andy Warhol, Jackie Under My Skin, and The Queen's Throat, which was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 2020, he received an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature, and his literary archives are held at Yale's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscripts Library. He's a distinguished professor of English, French, and Comparative Literature at the City University of New York Graduate Center, and we're delighted to welcome Wayne back to Bennington. Why shouldn't I begin with dreams? Delmore Schwartz did. My first writing teacher told me that a story of mine, embarrassingly sentimental, reminded her of Schwartz's in dreams begin responsibilities. I use dreams to escape responsibilities, not to fulfill them. Last night's dream, complicated, involved Harissa, I began to say. But in fact, last night's dream didn't involve Harissa. Language leads me into the trap of saying what's not true. Or language leads me to say what's true, but in a masked fashion. Harissa, the word that had no part in my dream, but that came to mind when I entertained the notion of telling you my dream, is a hot paste I'm not fond of. I don't like spicy food, though I once did. I've become like my maternal grandfather, a rhetoric prone man with a tetchy stomach. Or I've become a tetchy man with a rhetoric prone stomach. Back to Harissa and its secret truth. My sister's name is Elissa. And when I mentioned in Dreams Begin Responsibilities at the beginning of this paragraph, I wanted to use the word haruspicate. Haruspicate and Elissa meet on the turf too spicy of Harissa. I overuse haruspicate because like Schwartz's narrator, I'm always metaphorically in a movie theater watching a film of my parents' courtship. At the end of this paragraph, I'll stand up in the theater and shout, don't do it, don't get married. Would you rather hear about my grandfather's high-flown rhetoric or about his dyspeptic stomach? Or would you rather that I speculate about the connection between rhetoric and digestion? To engage in those speculations, I'd need first to tell you about the prudent warnings of my grandmother, the wife of the man with a nervous stomach. My grandmother would say to me in a restaurant, don't fill up on water. I had a habit of guzzling ice water before the meal arrived. 
For the past week, I've been overindulging in bubbly water. The more seltzer I drink, the more I will resemble a poem in which a perfect adequation obtains between emotion and language. This attachment to seltzer, this conviction that carbonated water corrects a possible asymmetry between form and content in a poem or in a life arose only recently and in response to re-seeing Fellini's La Strada. The relation between Giulietta Messina's face and the Nina Rota theme that is her lachrymose leitmotif is like the relation between ice water and satiation. The two elements don't exist in a system of cause and effect, but hover around each other until they grow inextricable. Like the lichen I saw this afternoon covering a wooden chair that has been a mainstay of my backyard patio for so many seasons that I can no longer sit on the chair without intruding on the lichen and perhaps destroying it. The chair and the lichen exist in a subtle tug of war, like a bickering couple, Martha and George, in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, a man and wife who exchange the roles of aggressor and victim with such rapidity that the spectator has a difficult time deciding which of the two characters deserves our sympathy and which deserves our scorn. George with his cardigan and his crestfallenness represents my condition as academic, while Martha represents the pitfalls of my mistaken use of volubility as the key weapon in my quest to be popular. Popularity, the quest for it, the impossibility of achieving it haunted my childhood. I was popular in fourth grade. In fifth grade, alas, my popularity vanished and it never returned with the same abundance. In dreams begin responsibilities and who's afraid of Virginia Woolf have in common an overvaluation of the past and a disdain for the present. This overvaluation, however, isn't exactly nostalgia. I'm not nostalgic for fourth grade. I'm simply telling you that my tragic sense began there or shortly afterward when I realized it was possible to possess something intangible, popularity, that by vanishing without warning would define the period of drought that followed as monstrous rather than merely as disappointing. Writing, the art, the attempt, takes place for me against a symphonic background in which the monstrous is like a dominant seventh chord that threatens to topple the kingdom and the disappointing is like a piccolo that skims a hummingbird above the cello and violin. A piccolo as a single instrument can't create a dominant seventh chord. It can participate in the chord's formation by supplying one of the notes, but it can't summon simultaneously all of the pitches that the chord requires to announce its threshold adjudicating presence. The dominant seventh stands guard at the precipice and no monologic instrument can utter the full medicine. It's likely that I've lost by now the thread of whatever logical sequence of images and ideas brought me to this juncture where I stand somewhat plaintively offering you the life raft of an apology. I believe in acting shamelessly, but I also believe in apologizing afterward. 
and every sentence, even the most pithy and sincere, needs to be followed by a retraction. Did the Oedipus complex arrive in the interpretation of dreams in a single sentence, or did it slowly drape its wares over a whole chapter? I seem to recall that it takes Freud a few hundred pages to arrive in his oneric tome at the Oedipus complex. But when that formula enters from stage left, it does so in a flurry of italics and trumpets with a sense that dear Sigmund, though at the time only 44 years old, has reached the pinnacle of his promise. Because Freud invented the concept of Nachtraglichkeit or afterwardsness, which destroys the tidy relation of before and after. His announcement of the Oedipus complex happens helter skelter, a limb at a time, even when it seems to land in one clean moment. Did Freud ever apologize for the Oedipus complex? Is the incoherence of its arrival the apology? And why might it matter to you whether or not Freud apologized or was incoherent or was 44 years old? I took a break from writing this commencement speech to look at Instagram, where I saw that a man in London whom I'd drawn nude during a Zoom session last week, posted the seven drawings I'd sent him from our session and had tagged me. I was pleased to see that my model, whose screen name is AA, which are, I believe, his initials and not an allusion to Alcoholics Anonymous, had disseminated the drawings because then other people who follow his account might look at my Instagram feed with its many drawings of nude men and feel prompted to send me a DM and offer to pose. Such offers come to me more often than you might imagine, and I usually say yes. Before returning to the computer to continue writing this valedictory address, I scrolled through the list of people who had liked the nude drawings that AA had posted on his feed to see if I might wish to visit some of those feeds in a search for new models. During the pandemic, I have devoted many hours to drawing live models in Zoom sessions, sometimes convened by organizations such as the Renaissance Workshop, Bear Life, such as the Renaissance Workshop, Bear Life Art, Chicago Gay Drink and Draw, the East London Drawing Group, or Doable Guys. And sometimes in private sessions, I arrange with men who've joined me in the courtship gavat, the out of the blue exchange of DMs. I always apologize before the session to the models and tell them that my drawings will be rudimentary expressionist, colorful, but not realistic. I'm untrained, I tell my subjects, which is not exactly true, but I don't want them to be disappointed when they see that I've messed up their proportions. And so I seek shelter under the protective shade of the I'm untutored tree. In writing, I'm perhaps too tutored, so in drawing, I like to advertise my untutored innocence. And yet, did anyone teach me how to write? Teachers and my peers showed me how to cast a cold eye on what I'd produced. This cold eye comes in handy. I spend much of my writing life impersonating the cold eye, becoming the cold eye so thoroughly that there is no wane left only cold eye, only grammar, diction, taste, rhythm, illusion, referent, connotation, oxymoron, peripatia, assonance, continuity, spondee. What no one taught me is that to write, I must sink away from one form of conscious navigation and surrender to what language decrees. 
I must dwell firmly enough within the language net to feel that my experiences in the moment of writing are a consequence of the words and not simply their catalyst. Fiction writers often say that they listen to what their characters tell them. Not entirely a fiction writer, I listen to what language tells me. I instigate the process, but once the language commences its relentless hum, punctuated by doldrum and silence and distraction and Instagram and anxiety, then I occupy the position of the cook who has been given the lamb and the milk and the lettuce, but didn't create them. Even if I planted the romaine and watered it and harvested it, I am not its originator. I don't mint or coin or engender the words, though I twist and pervert them. Language, its codes and leanings surrounds me and I try to make myself as inconspicuous as possible so that language can have its way with me. Though I seem in my eye-centered prose and poetry to be naked, I am in fact half hidden behind the shrubbery of this prepositional phrase, which wields its barricade of leaf and bud according to natural laws. I can't make myself known to you without this rule governed armature whose wendings and reprisals must take precedence over my ideas, even if languages caparisoned marauders need the mulch of my ideation in order to have a ground to trample. I arrived here at this peroration in order to be trampled by language, coddled to and stimulated and ignored. Does language give me suck or does it turn away? A few weeks ago, I dreamt I wrote that phrase, does language give me suck? When I woke up, I remembered that Adrian Rich had used the expression give suck to in a poem I often revisit Paula Becker to Clara Westhoff, quoting Rich. I love waking in my studio, seeing my pictures come alive in the light. Sometimes I feel it is myself that kicks inside me, myself I must give suck to love, unquote. When I use the archaic phrase, give suck, I am re-inhabiting this poem by Rich, in which she imagines occupying the voice of artist Clara Westhoff, who later married Rilke. No word I use is untainted by my sometimes conscious memories of how I have heard or read that word used in the past by specific and general voices. When I use the word general, go back a sentence. When I use the archaic phrase, give suck, I am re-inhabiting this poem by Rich in which he imagines occupying the voice of artist Clara Westhoff who later married Rilke. No word I use is untainted by my sometimes conscious memories of how I have heard or read that word used in the past by specific and general voices. When I use the word general, I am shadowed by a line from James Joyce's The Dead. Snow was general all over Ireland. When I'm weighing my words or being weighed by them, I'm handling goods loaded with all I've seen them undergo. I write in order to rehearse the drama again with them, to be Delmore Schwartz or his narrator in the movie theater, an observer powerless to arrest or alter the unfolding tragedy. And now I remember the word I love most in Schwartz's story, lip. The windowsill when he wakes as a lip of snow, a phrase that reminds me of Emily Dickinson's Rite of Frost 
or hour of lead. Lip of snow, to notice you and to kiss you, to be frozen by you, to be ignored by you, and to vanquish your indifference through my compensatory acts of precise attention are the reasons I read and write. Was that sentence too complicated? Try again. Schwartz gave me the lip of snow. I memorized it. I'm fed by it. Lip of snow gives me suck. Lip of snow is language's lip because lip, the word, is louder, more pronounced, more generous than any other moment in the story and maybe more than any moment in our interpersonal life. Has anyone showered you with a precision, a benediction of frost? It can be a blessing to grow insensible, more pointed and eviscerating than Schwartz's lip of snow, or than what the lip in its metaphoric obliquity seems to promise? Lip of snow, the phrase, will keep its promise. Sixth grade will arrive and you will graduate from grammar school and say good morning to the mature midnight of linguistic trickery. The whole time I was growing up in San Jose, it never snowed or it snowed but once, as they might have said in the 19th century. The day it snowed, I was sick, deemed too ill to leave my bed, step outside and see the snow. Doubtless, there was not much to see. The snow must have melted the instant it landed on the sidewalk and the lawn, the pachysandra and the pyracantha, the lava rocks and the fence, the gutter and the rambler station wagon, the 1955 green Chevy, and what I now make in retrospect of the gutter what I demand of the lava rocks and the rambler. I don't ask them to explain what they symbolize. I don't ask them what brings them together on this snowy morning in spring. I simply say thank you to them for being nouns, for being objects I remember, things with recognizable though vacillating identities, presences, that will never cease to beckon as thresholds of the marvelous, even if the marvels die out and disappoint, even if the fence breaks and the gutter overflows. Thank you. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty and administration of the writing seminars, we are assembled here to give formal voice to the awarding of degrees to the 52nd graduating class of the writing seminars. This assembly provides a fitting occasion to reaffirm the principles of this remarkable college. I want to begin by reading to you from the traditional commencement statement, which we have presented since the beginning. Bennington regards education as a sensual and ethical, no less than an intellectual process. It seeks to liberate and nurture the individuality, the creative intelligence, and the ethical and aesthetic sensibility of its students to the end that their richly varied natural endowments will be directed toward self-fulfillment and toward constructive social purposes. The Bennington Writing Seminars offers an ongoing community of kindred spirits and constructive counsel honoring the solitary nature of writing and reading and the collaborative voices of education. The degrees we are about to award certify that these students have successfully met the standards of quality in academic and creative achievement set by the college. However one chooses to use the MFA degree in writing and literature, the emphasis for these students has been on the broad, fundamental, and specific concerns of the merits of the work at hand, as well as on a participation in the life of letters. And to that end, we have also focused on reading literature. 
The extent to which these candidates have fulfilled the college's important philosophical aims cannot be formally certified, but the degrees do indeed express our confidence that these students have understood our ideals and that they will continue to do credit to themselves and to their communities. At Bennington, the awarding of the degrees means at least one other thing. Education here is a reciprocal affair. We who are charged with the instruction and educational policy have received as well as given. We have learned from these students as well as taught and advised them. The conferring of the degree is thus an acknowledgement of the contribution to ourselves personally and to the college, which these students have made. We shall follow these students with interest and affection as they continue their roles in other communities. To those communities, we confidently recommend them. At Bennington, we shall miss them. Brandon Adams. Allison Berkeley. Joni Claire Chan. Catherine Crosby. Molly Dumbleton. Yay! Megan Flaherty. William Glidden. Good luck and congratulations. Thank you. Woohoo! Yeah, Billy! Tamara Helms. Craig Holt. Natalie Mann. Stacy Reznikoff, Laurel Rom, Elizabeth Reardon, Lindsay Ryan, Mariana Sabino. Mary Alice Stewart, <laughs> M. Claudia Trifa, Erica Verink, Judy Wang, Patty Wahlberg, Natalie Warther.